Thank you everyone for um, your practice and for being here and your love of, of uh, goodness and virtue and truth and Buddhas. Um, uh, and thanks so much for sharing what's alive for you. <clears throat> and uh, I uh, want to talk about something that's quite alive for me um, on, on my path in my meditation. And uh, first, I'll start just by paying homage to the Buddha. <clears throat> Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama samputasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama samputasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama samputasa. So I want to speak about becoming one's own best friend. And um, I'm going to begin with a amazing story that's in uh, uh, one of the collections of the Buddha's teachings that we all know a lot about, but we don't actually know that we know a lot about. It's the Kudaka Nikaya, and Kudaka just means minor or small. So I think a lot of us know about the long discourses, the middle length discourses, and the numerical discourses, um, and uh, the, the connected discourses, the Samyutta Nikaya, and this is the fifth collection, the fifth Nikaya, the Kudaka Nikaya of the Pali Canon. And the reason a lot of us know it is because so many of the teachings that we, um, that are, are near and dear to us are actually from this, this Nikaya, the Metta Sutta, the uh, Dhammapada, the, um, the Mangala Sutta, the Ratana Sutta, uh, the um, Udana, which is the beautiful sayings, the Itibuddhika, uh, the Sutta Nipata, I think some of those will be familiar to people. And they're all in this minor, minor, which they're not minor, they're major teachings, they're wonderful, but it's a minor collection. Um, and this is a story that's in the Udana, which is uh, translated as the beautiful sayings. And what it is, is the king of Kosala, uh, Pasenadi, and his wife, uh, Malika, are up on the very uh, top balcony of the palace, looking over their kingdom. And the king turns to his queen and says, uh, Queen Malika, is there anyone that you love more than yourself? And she answers the king, no. There's no one that I love more than myself. And she asks him, and what about you? Is there anyone that you love more than yourself? And he answers, no, there's no one that I love more than myself. And they go and tell the Buddha, well, King Pasenadi goes and tells the Buddha about this conversation. And the Buddha is, you know, he's just like, silent in, in agreement, and then utters these beautiful verses that having gone around in all directions with the mind, there is surely no one found who's loved more than oneself. In the same way, others each love themselves. Therefore, one who cares for themselves should not harm another. And this idea of loving oneself is so fundamental to the, the Eightfold Noble Path. This is so fundamental to the spiritual path, to the Buddha's teachings. The Buddha often gives this instruction, uh, this teaching, I found it more than a dozen times in, in almost all of the, the Nikayas, and sometimes to Moggallana, to uh, Ananda, to, to many of the very, very most well-known disciples, the Buddha says, be an island unto yourself. No, have no other refuge except yourself. Have the Dhamma as your refuge. Have yourself as your refuge. 
that when we are turning to the Dhamma, when, we are, when the Dhamma is growing inside of us, this becomes a refuge. Be an island unto yourself. So this whole idea of really, really um, unpacking, unraveling that, that harsh voice, that, 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 you know, um, relentless, can be relentless, uh, inner critic. The, the Buddha is so much trying to help us understand that um, it all starts here. It all starts here. It all starts here. And then, and then it goes out. Um, so that's what I wanted to talk about today. Like, how do we do that? How do we do that with some of our conditioning? Um, yeah, the Buddha says uh, in the Dhammapada, quite a famous verse we might all know, if by giving up a lesser happiness, one would experience greater happiness, a wise person would renounce the lesser to behold the greater. So this is sort of the, the strategy, you know, that it, it, for us to really start to have this be palpable, tangible, real in our own moment to moment experience, we, it, it's going to take some determination, but mostly it's going to take wisdom. Mostly it's going to take um, an, a different understanding about how to go about life. Um, the wise person gives up the, the lesser happiness, the more immediate, you know, more, more accessible happiness for the greater happiness. Um, this is what the wise person does. I'm, I'm sure many people are familiar with the marshmallow test. If you're familiar with the marshmallow test, put up your hand. Yeah, okay. All right, so a couple of us are. Um, I'll just quickly say, it's a very powerful um, longitudinal research experiment where, and actually you can go on YouTube and it's almost worth doing because you can watch videos of these dear little children that are, okay, so now Sheila knows what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, so the experiment was set up where the experimenter would be in a room that had a video camera with a child. And I think typically they pick around four-year-olds and um, the four-year-old is given a plate with a marshmallow sitting on the plate. And the instructions are, if you don't eat this marshmallow for 10 minutes, I'm, I'm going to leave and don't eat the marshmallow for 10 minutes. I'll come back and you can have two. You can have two marshmallows. So this is giving up a lesser happiness, 10 minutes to get a greater happiness, the two marshmallows. And the, the research is very powerful. This is like delayed gratification, right? And this is a very very, um, it's a very, very powerful predictor of happiness, of, of, of health and well-being. So they follow these four-year-olds. Of course, some can't do it and some do. And that's very predictive of um, success by peer report, teacher report, parental report. I, I'm not even sure if it's self-report, but and it, I don't know how many years out it goes, but giving up a lesser happiness for a greater happiness. And I, I just want to talk about how to do that with wisdom and with, with joy and with kindness. Um, how do we do that? I think to be realistic, it's very important that we understand some of our, our own habit patterns and even, you know, look at some familial ha habit patterns and 
uh, and a lot of our cultural conditioning um, being, you know, I, I can, I, of course, I can only speak for myself. I'm, I'm white and I grew up, you know, in a very wasp environment, very, very, um, uh, and I, and I, and I was definitely in the dominant culture and there was a lot about a lot of individualism and a lot about performance and, you know, heaven's not cheap and a lot of the Protestant work ethic. And I mean, I could just go on and on. And I think that many of us might have a, some different versions of that, but lots of us have had that conditioning that is part of where we're at in in such an individualistic um in in a dominant culture that's been very individualistic um because then there there's a lot of um ideas about me and how did i perform and what grade did i get and where did i come in the race and etc cetera, etc cetera. um Along with that, you know, um, North American, European, North American heritage, we have this whole hero worship, this whole dragon slang, you know, uh, Hercules, Hercules had uh, these 12 tasks, and they were punitive, they were um, because he had gone crazy and killed his wife and his children. I mean, this is so much our heritage. Hercules, you know, was given these 12 tasks. And the second of the tasks was to slay this nine headed uh, sort of demon dragon that had nine heads. And uh, the issue was Hercules, you know, he's, and again, there's just so much of this in, in, our heritage, you know, so Her Hercules goes and he cuts off the, one of the nine heads and immediately two heads grow where the one was. So he has to enlist the help of his nephew who then Hercules cuts off a head and then the nephew immediately cauterizes the, the wound, you know, and, and nothing grows. So this is how he's cutting off these nine heads and he gets to the middle head, which ends up to be eternal. Hydra is this this beast that he's fighting, um, and so he 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 get, finally gets this immortal head off, but it it you know it falls to the ground and it keeps talking and it keep it's it's immortal, and so what does Hercules do? He he buries this this immortal head under a huge boulder, and I think that this is significant. This is how. It's just, you know, in our DNA, many of us, not all of us, but many of us, it's in our DNA that this is how we handle the difficult. We just try and cut the head off, you know, and then if that doesn't work, then bury it, you know, stuff it under a rock. And th this, I think many of us are paying the price for this approach this like cut it out you know lop it off stuff it away there can be a whole different way to to be with the difficult and some of you i i know you a little bit you know and i know you are practicing with these things you're not going around you know just cutting off parts of ourselves and it doesn't work. It, it's very violent. And, and there's the rare case where this is, this is an appropriate strategy, but to have this carte blanche, you know, across the board is very detrimental to all of us. Um, there is this amazing quote, this beautiful man, he's a, an American writer, Brian Brian Andreas, I think is his name. He's the founder of this um, beautiful publishing organization called Story People. Anyway, 
he has he he makes these stories story people and and he often will have a poster with a, a drawing it's both art and visual art and words but this one poster i saw it says and it just it, it really touched me deeply it really resonated with me it says um anyone can slay a dragon he told me but try waking up every morning and loving the world all over again. That's what takes a real hero. So I, I really feel like this dragon slaying psyche energy um, is something that is good for us to be very aware of that, that, that for many of us, that's definitely been you know a download it's it's in our heritage it's in our ancestry and um there is another way and i think uh that amazing teaching of the buddha that probably most of us know where he's describing the experience of an enlightened being of an arahant and he uses the metaphor of the arahant is struck by an arrow and that's it the unenlightened being is struck by an arrow and then another arrow and then for some of us myself lots of times and then another arrow and another arrow and another arrow you know, the arahant will experience a physical unpleasant, it will experience unpleasant sensation, unpleasant Vedana. But that's it. But for us, we experience unpleasant, unpleasant Vedana. We don't understand what's really going on fully, deeply, completely. We really don't understand the escape. And we have a, another arrow because of this arrow. And then sometimes another arrow and another arrow. So how to become our own best friend that when that arrow is there, we can, we can know it, we can attend to it, we can care about it, but we're not, we're not compounding the pain. I have this... Uh, uh, incredible privilege to watch my daughter. Uh, she has two children, five and two and a half. And she's really doing attachment parenting. Like she's really showing up. Um, of course, it's not perfect because she's not perfect by any means. And she didn't receive it. She's giving something to her children that she didn't fully receive from me. I guarantee you. But um, I watch her with her children and I really think of this, I really think of this teaching of the Buddha with that second arrow. And, and I, I feel like I'm witnessing, oh, this is how, this is how sati, mindfulness, it's actually a feminine Pali word. I think it's very feminine. For me, it's beginning to work to think of sati as the mother, you know, the, the attuned mother. That might not work for some people, but, but I encourage you to explore, have sati, of mindfulness, become a relationship, be the, your best friend. We got to see um, an interview yesterday through Wisdom Publication of Venerable Analio and Mingyur Rinpoche. It was unbelievable, these two great beings riffing about emptiness. But um, at some point, the commentator asked Venerable Analio to speak about mindfulness. And it was so, I mean, Venerable Analio just goes, he's this big smile, you know, he goes, Sati, my best friend. You know, we've, we've We've spent so much time together over the years. It was just, it was very beautiful. 
So this idea of the mother is really working for me. And I watch my daughter, you know, and she'll be with her children and, you know, they fall or their toy breaks and there's an upset. And this is the first, the first arrow. And then, and then she just shows up and then she just witnesses and, and it dissolves it, it, she attends to the upset. So the, the issue doesn't change. The scrape is there. The fall happened. The toy is broken. But that, that can be it when it's witnessed, when, it's, when there's something attuned to it, when it's held, when it's cared for, and when it, there's not a need for it to change. It was this amazing time. We were um, at a playground, and it was, it was during that heat wave in June. And my daughter lives, you know, up in like around Vancouver and in, in Canada. And uh, you get to this playground and it's so high, you know, it's like 100 degrees and you get out of the car and we're like, we're like, wow, it's wild. There's no one here. And then we get to the playground equipment and it's burning. Like you can't, you can't even touch the swings or the, the slide, you know, and so we're like, what are we doing? This is nuts. We need to go to a water park. So we're having this conversation and we turn around and head back to the car. And this poor little two year, two and a half year old didn't track that whole conversation. And they're like, what's going on? We just got to the playground, what, you know, and starts to have a fit. And my daughter just gets down and understands it all. You know, of course, you, of course, you don't want to go. And of course, you don't want to get back in a hot car. And, you know, of course, you're upset. And it's just there and didn't even need to say, but you have to go and, but you have to get back in the car and nothing, just be with the upset and, and it takes care of itself. It's an amazing thing. And I, I really think that the Buddha is inviting us to become our absolute best friend. And sati is is how we how we can do that we just genuinely are curious and care about what's really going on and whatever's going on it's okay i mean what what are you gonna do if you're mad you're mad and then and then don't don't add you know four other arrows that make it complicated of like, oh, you know, I shouldn't be mad or I shouldn't have got that mad or I shouldn't have said that. Or no, it's kind of like, oh, gee, you know. Um, I, I, I'm just really speaking for myself. I, I've tried all the strategies of, you know, the shoulds and the, and the pushing down and, the, and, I, and I, I've got myself in a lot of knots that are now, you know, finally thawing and, and untying, but it, it's through, I, 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 yeah, okay, sorry, I've got, I'm really into kids, so it, does anyone know that, you know, um, going on a bear hunt, do you know that story, like, going on a bear hunt, you know, and then, and then you come to this, this, like, thick mud, and then the, the song is, you know, can't go over it, can't go around it, gotta go through it. And I, I think that, I think that that, like, we, we just have to be with what is there. I mean, it's so basic, but we, I've, I've spent a long time being really, and I still go, go there, like, denying what I really feel and and shooting myself, you know, and, and overriding and, and, and I mean, gosh, we get, we get really, we get fragmented, you know, we get neurotic, we get cancer, we get, you know, we get a lot of things by doing that. Um, and so I, I actually think the Buddha is, I think, I think that we have to be careful with some of the suttas, some of the scriptures that talk about like obliterating and 
you know, um, uh, to, you know, not tolerating. I think that there is a cultural context that these teachings were given in. And I think for some of us with some of our conditioning, I think, I think that the Buddha, I think the Buddha would have said it differently, honestly. The same, the same stuff, the same principles, but with some perhaps different strategies. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to just close with uh, another Dhammapada verse. It's one of my very favorites. Dhammapada 43. And this is translation by Gil Fronsdale. Neither mother nor father nor any other relative can do one as much good as one's own well-directed mind. Neither mother nor father nor any other relative can do one as much good as one's own well-directed mind. Ayakema often talks about the path. The spiritual path is um, the greatest love story. You know, this is us falling in love with what's here. Um, I heard Tanisaro Bhikkhu talk about meditation to him was like going on a date, taking his mind on a date. <laughs> I mean, it, it's lovely, I think, to, to play. I mean, do you think about mindfulness for me? Mindfulness so much is love. You know, it's a, it's a tension. And when you think about when you're falling in love, right? Every little thing, every little thing that that other person does, you're noticing and your thinking is delightful. And, you know, there's this invitation to fall in love with what's here, fall in love with the present moment. Um, yeah. So I'll end here and would invite any questions or comments. Um, Yeah, Mad. Hi, um, I just wanted to speak on like the whole you're saying like being mad and being angry. Um, it's kind of why I started going by Mad. Um, I went by Maddie for the first 18 years of my life, and then I realized I really struggled with feeling any feelings that were anything other than positive feelings. All of the negative, like upset emotions, it was something that was really difficult for me to feel and I had a really bad angry episode where it was like a panic attack and I was just feeling anger and I realized I've never granted myself the compassion to feel this emotion so I decided to like change my name go by mad so I could fully embody the negative feelings that I had been pushing away for so long and once I started being mad, like allowing myself to feel being mad, I was like, oh, I no longer have to be mad. I can choose when and where I can have these emotions, but I had to allow myself that kindness of feeling it in the first place. So I can now have the strength to move through those emotions much healthier. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Go ahead. Yes, thanks, Tingley. Uh, thank you, Aya, for that teaching. So it was a lot of the parts that were kind of making me laugh was yesterday. I was speaking to two of my good friends. They're uh, venerables. In Malaysia, and they're we're, we're the same age, and uh, we spent time at a temple together. And then we would often sneak off—not off, not too often—but to be naughty 
by temple standards and we just go to the stupa and hide and be like oh oh that 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 teacher i can't believe she yelled at me again you know something something and yesterday we were talking about how you know we we respected our teachers but one thing we always do is after meals after the meal we would gather and uh, tell tech pick pick the vegetables for tomorrow you know clean and take them apart and I would say to, I said, to them, I was like, did you ever notice that some of the ones who seem very serious as practitioners, they would want to appear very like stern, uh, like slaying the dragon. And I was like, they were so angry when they picked the vegetables. I felt so bad for the vegetables. And then the moment I said that, they were like, yes, I noticed that too. I was so afraid to say it. And then I was like, if you're so mean to the vegetables, what are we eating tomorrow? It's not very peaceful mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and I was like, these foods don't, uh, they don't serve us. You know, oh, we are equal in our life uh, value. And uh, it was just really funny because I think as young people going into the temples, it's, everything seems serene, but I think sometimes in our culture, like where I am, I'm part of the dominant culture too. So it has similarities to Wasp culture. Mm -hmm. uh, people like shoot arrows. Everyone wants to be the Bodhisattva ideal. So we pretend nothing's happening, but we just like snap off the, what do you call it? The, the arrow, the arrow shaft, but all the arrowheads still inside and you walk around and you're like, I'm fine. I'm, I'm the bodhisattva it's okay it's okay but then it comes out when you're picking vegetables or small oh, exactly vegetables. exactly so that's yeah. what that's what i was laughing because i was just talking about this with my two good friends yeah. the venerables yesterday yeah and and the the buddha definitely that's throughout the scriptures is really inviting us for it to be incredibly real truly becoming our own best friend yeah yes please tia one of the things your talk brought up for me was um i i, I struggle with the marshmallow uh report team uh and one of the things is that there's a there's a way that uh uh being able to make the choice like in, in my mind, the liberation we're talking about always uh, boils down to choice and consent, right? So I'm choosing to, with, to take a moment with this marshmallow and then there will be two marshmallows, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, am, I am exercising my ability to choose. Mm -hmm. And yet that same paradigm, the delayed gratification, mm -hmm. I use it for and against myself yes. all the time. Yes. yes, yes, yes. I'll sleep when I'm dead. Like, no, stop that. Yes. Cut that out. Yeah, sleep now. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's a it's super interesting to me when I'm I don't know choosing not skillfully. I don't even know how to. No, I, no, no. You you you're right on it, and and I don't think I had enough time. You, I, I'm so glad you said that. And, you know, it makes me think of not even doing that, going to that, you know, because you're right. I think in the scriptures, the Buddha is saying it's the wise person that chooses to give up the, the lesser happiness for the greater happiness. So you're 100 percent right. Sometimes we're making that choice, but it's not from wisdom. It's from willpower or guilt or or just un unexamined conditioning or or people pleasing or you know insecurity or, yeah so only when it's coming from wisdom you, you're thank you you're you're actually that's very important what you just said you're right i mean that same behavior can be exactly the exactly the opposite of everything i was trying to talk about in and yeah thank you Yeah. Oh, please. Yes. Yes. Oh, unmute. Yeah. Great. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for for that Dhamma talk. It was really beautiful. Uh, can I ask what what's the name of the sh children question um, children song uh, about the map? Uh, 
going through it. it oh, yeah, yeah. Going on a bear, going on a bear hunt. On a bear hunt. Okay. Yeah. I think that's really easy to remember just to stay with those moments that are really yeah. frustrating rather than just trying to <laughs> where I go. Yeah, I, I, honestly, sometimes I even do it in meditation, you know, can't go over it, can't go under <laughs> it, got to go through it, yeah. Please, Sheila, and then and then uh, and then we should be closing. Yeah, please, Sheila. Thank you, Aya Ahimsa. Um, and I think you may have just answered. As a monastic, what are your secrets, strategies for those moments of um, the the letting go of the immediate gratification mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. long view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's a really layered question because there's some that are really like immediate and then some that are very far reaching, you know? Like for me, um, becoming a monastic meant uh, leaving my children. They were, you know, they were in the early twenties, but I knew that that meant I wouldn't be a really hands-on grandmother should they have children. So the way I did that one was the wisdom one, like, and I still have to do that kind of talk to myself, like Ahimsa, you know, yeah, you're not there at the birthday dinners, you're not there at Christmas, you're not giving gifts, you know, but you are trying to learn to love yourself and have more common peace. And you actually have something more valuable to give your children. So sometimes it's a really long, you know, long scope. The minute to minute, I think as a monastic, it's quite the same as a lay person, the minute to minute, like, so um, I, I like what Tia is saying. I mean, I am trying, I've been quite a, like quite a achieving disciplined push person. And so it's actually, I'm trying to learn to like have fun, you know, relax, chill. Um, so I think it really depends on your conditioning, you know, like it's all so much about middle way you know so much of all the teachings is about balance and and flexibility having a range that we don't just have this one go-to strategy this one you know and every when all you have is a hammer everything looks like a nail you know like um so i think i think they're really similar the i i think it's that I think this might resonate for Tia. I think that it's that real, that pause, that mindfulness and that willingness to pose the question. What, what would feel, what would feel, what would feel good? You know, what would feel caring? What would feel kind to, to me and to this other person? You know, sometimes it's a pause. Sometimes it's a not answering. Like, would you do this thing? Um, let me get back to you. Like, it's, sometimes it's that, like giving ourselves space. Yeah. To, to think it through. Yeah. So we're, we're actually over our time. Wow. I, I really enjoyed this group <laughs> so much. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, yeah, may we all, you know, learn to love better, love, love ourselves, love those around us, love the earth. Yeah, love the present moment, love the pain, love the weakness. Yeah, yeah, may we all. So um, I'll just chant a, a blessing and uh, may we dedicate the merits of of all our all our efforts on the path to uh, the well being of 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 others and ourselves. Yeah. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you. 
by the power of all the Buddhas. May you ever be well. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you by the power of all the Dhamma. May you ever be well. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you by the power of all the Sangha. May you ever be well. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Can I just show you one thing? This is, um, because I'm realizing you might not know what it is. This, oh, weighs so much. Oh, geez. This is, uh, it was a really like shiny bronze Buddha Rupa. This is, this is a Rupa that totally burnt in, uh, in the fire in one of our outbuildings. So now we just have it here. <laughs> yeah, pretty intense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's what that is. I think it looks a little funny on the screen, so. Yeah. <laughs>